cross-border payments is perceived as one of the most complex topics in payments. The subject is not easy, but most often it is not taught properly. We have an approach to make things really easy for you. You can learn cross-border payments and become an expert pretty quickly if you understand and adopt the right strategies. This video is about the powerful strategies to understand how cross-border payments work. Hi, I'm John Paul, payment author and trainer. I run the blog Paymentor.com and I'm co-founder of Pemrix, a QualiOP certified training organization and a career accelerator for payment professionals. I have over 17 years of experience in the payment industry. In the next minutes, you will discover the four key strategies to understand how cross-border payments work. After presenting the four strategies, we will take a closer look at the first two strategies. List it carefully and you will see that cross-border payments are not as complex as you may think. Before looking at the four strategies, let's first answer this important question. What is a cross-border payment? How would you define it? Simply put, an international payment or cross-border payment is a transfer that must go through the border of the monetary zone where it is originated. It is an electronic fund transfer in a foreign currency or between two accounts located in different countries. Here, both destination and currency of the payment play an important role. The table you see here illustrates domestic and cross-border payments depending on the currency and the destination country of the transfer. We assume that the country where the transfer is originated is, is Australia, but you can take any other country or monetary zone. There are four quadrants. Quadrant 1 depicts domestic payments. If the currency of transfer is the national currency and the destination country of transfer is the same country, then it is a domestic payment. An example is the transfer in Australian dollar from Australia to a beneficiary in Australia. Except this first quadrant, everything else is a cross-border payment. And we will see why. As you see in quadrant two, if the currency of transfer is the national currency and the destination country of transfer is a foreign country, then it is a cross-border payment. With country, we refer to a monetary union or monetary zone like the SEPA area, for example, not only a geographical country. An example is a transfer in Australian dollar from Australia to a beneficiary in Germany, USA or Brazil. Even if it is the local currency, the beneficiary is outside the country and the payment must cross the border and credit an account in a foreign country. The account located in the foreign country can be in any currency, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar or Euro, it does not matter. Quadrant 3 is interesting because we rarely think of it, but it does happen in reality. If the currency of transfer is a foreign currency and the destination country of transfer is the same country, then it is a cross-border payment. This sounds a bit weird, but the reason is that since the payment involves a foreign currency, a transfer must happen in that foreign country. An example is a transfer in US dollar from Australia to a beneficiary in Australia. That transfer must debit and credit accounts in the, US, in the United States, even if both parties are customers of two banks located in Australia. Finally, we have quadrant four. If the currency of transfer is a foreign currency and the destination country of transfer is a foreign country, then it is a cross-border payment. An example is a transfer in euro or pound sterling from Australia to a beneficiary in Germany, USA or Brazil. This is easy to understand and many people believe this is the only case where the payment is a cross-border payment. But there are two other cases as we saw before. After this definition, let's look at the four key strategies to understand how cross-border payments work. 
what you are going to learn can help you save precious time and even money because many really struggle with it in the industry. What you will learn will empower you and set you apart in the industry. I will first provide an overview of the strategies and then we will take a closer look at the first two strategies. The first strategy is understand the principles behind the organization of market infrastructures in the different countries. The second strategy, grasp the principles of correspondent banking and account relationships between banks located in different currency zones. This is the most important of the four, as we will see later. The third strategy is understand the role of the SWIFT network and the SWIFT standards. And finally, the strategy number four is the following. Study the basics of foreign exchange markets and how financial institutions use them. When many begin with cross-border payments, they jump into the SWIFT messages right away. The messages are important, but after many years in the industry and many years teaching this, we now know that jumping into the messages is not the right approach. It is even counterproductive. So take the time to really understand these strategies before diving into the SWIFT messages and you will acquire cross-border payment skills faster. Let's consider the strategy number one. Understand the principles behind the organization of market infrastructures in the different countries in the world. Cross-border payments involve two or more countries. If we can easily find out how market infrastructures are organized in any country, then that will help us to understand what happens when an instruction reaches a foreign country. For that, we get back to a key tool that was introduced in the previous video, the generic model of payment systems in a country. This model can help us to analyze and study the payment market infrastructures of any country as we saw in a previous video. The key point here is the following. In any country, payment market infrastructures are organized almost in the same way. There are central bank systems and ancillary systems that banks join for the exchange, clearing and settlement of payment transactions. Banks join the central bank systems and one or many ancillary systems. The ancillary systems are connected to the central bank systems because the settlement of transactions ultimately happens in the central bank systems. With this structure, it is easy to see how domestic payments are cleared and settled in any country and what may happen to a payment instruction that arrives from abroad. Do keep this structure in mind. Now, let's move to the second strategy. Grasp the principles of correspondent banking and account relationships between banks located in different currency zones. This is the most important of all the four strategies because at the end of the day, payments are about moving funds. And in cross-border transfers, funds move through correspondent accounts. So grasping the principle of correspondent banking and account relationships is essential. The basis, the foundation of correspondent banking is the account relationship. We can even say that the account relationship is the passport to access the payment systems of other countries. That will become very clear pretty soon. Let us consider the payment systems of two countries, France and the United States. French banks have customers who want to transfer funds to the United States. For example, parents may need to pay the tuition of the child who is studying at the university in the States. And in the United States, there are people who want to transfer funds in Europe. We can imagine a French company that is supplying a product to a US company and wants the payment to be made in Europe. There are other cases we can easily think of. We see that banks need to send and receive payments in foreign currency to serve their customers. But they can do it on their own behalf too. If a French bank wants to send or receive US dollars, then it needs to get access to the USA payment systems. And the same thing applies for US Bank. 
If it wants to send or receive euro, then it needs to get access to the euro payment systems. Now the question is, how do banks access payment systems of foreign countries? The answer is actually quite simple. They become customer of a bank located in the monetary zone that they want to have access to. A bank, customer of another bank? This may sound weird for beginners, but that is what they do. Like individuals and corporations open bank accounts to send and receive funds, banks do the same to send and receive funds in foreign currency. They become customers of banks located in the foreign country. The account open in the foreign country is called correspondent account. Here, the French bank 4 asks a US bank, the bank D, offering correspondent account services to open an account. When the account is open, the French bank 4 becomes an end party for bank D, like companies or individuals that have an account with bank D. The French bank can now access the US payment systems through the account it has with bank D. The bank D may also open an account with bank 4, but it is not mandatory. Let us assume the French bank is BNP Paribas and the US bank is Citigroup. When BNP Paribas opens an account with Citi, both banks enter into what is called a correspondent account relationship. The bank in the USA becomes the correspondent of the French bank in USD currency. Note that the account is open in the book of the bank in the United States, but it is the account of the French bank. If BNPP opens an account with Citibank, but Citibank does not open an account with BNPP, then both are in a unilateral account relationship. The relationship is unilateral because there is only one account open. However, if each bank opens an account with the other, then they will enter into what is called a bilateral account relationship. Now that we understand what an account relationship is, let's clarify the differences between Nostro, Vostro and Loro accounts. In the same way that corporations can open accounts with several banks, a bank itself can open different accounts with many other banks. Those accounts are called Nostro and Vostro or Loro accounts. The same accounts can be called Nostro, Vostro or Loro account. It depends on the relationship that a bank has with that account. To help you understand the difference between Nostro account, Vostro account and Loro account, we have added an additional bank on the picture. It can be any bank that is not part of the account relationship. BNPP has opened an account with Citi. Both BNPP and Citi have an account relationship. BNPP will call that account its Nostro account and Citi will call it, will call it, BNPP will call that account its Nostro account and Citi will call it the Vostro account of BNPP. As you see, we don't have two accounts, but only one. The same account is called Nostro account by the account owning bank and Vostro account by the account holding bank. Nostro is the Italian word for our, Vostro the Italian word for your and Loro the Italian word for their. The account belongs to BNPP since it has opened it. That is why BNPP calls it Nostro account. For BNPP employees, it is logically our account. Citi holds the account of BNPP. Therefore, Citi calls it Vostro account. For Citi employees, it is logically your account. If we now consider banks that are not part of the account relationship, they will call the account Loro account. Many people say Loro and mean Vostro. Be aware that to be strict, Loro should be used by a bank when it is not part of the account relationship. To summarize, here are some tips to remember easily what a Nostro or a Vostro account is. If you are working for a particular bank, that is your bank, the account of your bank which is held by another bank is the Nostro account. That account is not in the books of your bank. The account of another bank held by your bank is the Vostro account. That account is present in the book of your bank. 
The accounts of other banks that are not present in your books are called Loro accounts. Funds that BNPP has in currency are kept on the corresponding accounts. This is really a key point to understand. The bank obviously puts own money on its Nostro account, but the bank also puts the funds of its customer who have accounts in the same currency on the same Nostro accounts. There is a key rule in cross-border payments which states the currency never leaves the country of origin. Customers in France can open accounts in USD dollar with BNPP. Then BNPP will open accounts in its book for those customers. Each customer sees the amount of money in currency that is available on his account. And BNPP does the bookkeeping, but the funds are kept on the Nostra account of BNPP with Citi. For Citi, it is the money of BNPP, but in reality, BNPP has $500 thousand dollars of own money and there are seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of customers money city does not know how the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars are distributed among the customers that is the business of bnpp in the example above we consider the setting up of an account relationship between two different monetary zones a bank must do the same for all the currencies in which it wants to have an account relationship. A bank must do the same for all the currencies in which it wants to have a corresponding account or an account relationship. And there are over 200 currencies in the world. Therefore, one of the first decisions a bank must make in cross-border payments is to determine the currency it will handle. So which currencies will be part of their corresponding network. Now, it is easy to understand what a correspondent network is. It is simply the total number of currency accounts that a bank processes in the different currency zones. So the correspondent network determines the offering a bank can make to their customers. Like individuals and company, a bank may open many accounts in the same currency with the same bank or with different banks for practical reasons or for other reasons. Which currency should be part of the correspondent network is determined among others by the type of currency. This ends our analysis of the second strategy. For the remaining two strategies, I refer you to the articles on the blog paymentor.com or to videos on the YouTube channel of Pemrix. In the payment mastering program I created, you get a detailed analysis of all the four strategies. If you want to become highly skilled in payments in a pretty short time, then join the Payment Mastering Program. Register now before it is too late. It is a limited time offer. The Payment Mastering Program is only open for a few days, and then we close registration and start the class. Do not waste time. Do not procrastinate. Click the button below this video. If you join the program, you will make staggering progress and that will create many opportunities and possibilities for your career. So, see you in the program.